committed to being helpful um, to a fault. Um, so I'll start with book one. Yeah, let's just let's just do this, right? Uh, book one opens. Mm. Book one opens on a Saturday morning. Sam and his best friend Arnold have just just left a uh, a meeting at the log lodge. Uh, the, the anonymous service group's headquarters on Robertson Boulevard. All this story, this story takes place actually around this area, although I burn it down most of this part of town. Oh, spoiler alert. Um, and they take a couple newcomers, identical twins, to breakfast just down the street on Robertson. Seated as we were at one of the little iron tables littering the sidewalk, we could not help being ringside when the Bentley glided up and came to a quiet, elegant stop at the curb. The uniformed driver came round and opened the back passenger door. Winnie Tanninger emerged, and before you begin to complain about unlikely coincidences or start to object about the blatant artistic license you are convinced I've taken with the facts. Before that is, you lecture me on the limits of reader can be expected to go, suspending disbelief for the sake of a good story. Let me remind you that we were, after all, in West Hollywood on a Saturday morning within spitting distance of the Pacific Design Center that, like a giant blue sow suckling its litter of cute little decorator shops, <laughs> loomed in the sky behind us. And so besides the few of us who might have dropped in on our social club to see friends, most of the denizens of the neighborhood, which is to say a host of bachelor decorators and their overnight acquaintances, <laughs> adhered to a strict tradition called Saturday brunch, and so you were bound to see anyone who was anyone out and about. In other words, one more old decorator showing up for breakfast was hardly anything out of the ordinary, even one as deeply unpleasant as Winnie. And so to resume. When he emerged from the tinted window and finely upholstered sarcophagus of the back seat of the Bentley, swept a manicured hand through what one might call a suspiciously full mane of snowy white hair, then adjusted the folds and fit of what no doubt in Winnie's mind passed as suitable attire for a gentleman spending the weekend at his country house. Very tweedy and bespoke, very merchant ivory, Fortnum and Mason, Hepper and the boot, old boy. <laughs> he hesitated and with a predator's trained eye regarded everyone on the sidewalk with a thinly veiled look of disdain, as you might expect. All of us became deeply engrossed in our meals, focused on our plates, our coffee, the condiments, the maple syrup pitcher, the pavement, and everything might have been well, and nothing out of the ordinary have ever transpired. The world would have continued spinning on its wobbly axis if I had not, for some explicable, inexplicable reason, chosen to glance up from the origami flamingo I was fashioning out of my napkin. <laughs> and my heart stopped. For in that moment, out of the Bentley and into the glorious sunlight of Southern California, appeared a young man who was, as suggested by the pri proprietary fashion with which Winnie gestured to him, the old hawk's latest friend. <laughs> and yes, dear reader, even in a city where beauty is taken for granted, where handsome youth is a given, a constant supply everywhere you turn, replenished on a daily basis with fresh arrivals, each one beautiful, each one with a headshot and a dream, yes, it is still possible to notice. We are jaded but not dead. There are rare exceptions, and afterwards, as so often happens in the case of exceptions, especially exceptional beauty, but also in cases of miraculous encounters with the divine. Afterward, there would be some disagreement as to what precisely we'd all seen. What exactly had composed the experience? What specifically had caught our eye? As I think you can appreciate in this instance, everyone stared. Even our breakfast guests, mouths full of pancake and butter and syrup, gaped, slack-jawed. Fuck, said one in a mixture of envy and desire. Fuck. Echoed his twin in unequivocal agreement. And yet, as shamelessly shallow, yet not insincere appreciation of the use of traction might sound, further elaboration proved more of a challenge than you might anticipate. For beyond the mere praising of individual body parts, the ones visible at any rate, or those that could be guessed at, since his vision of perfection did happen to be fully clothed and so left something to the imagination. In short, and instead of simply saying things like, those eyes, that hair, that nose, that jaw, those lips. One was hard-pressed to explain more precisely the reasons for our profound reactions to the young man's appeal. Even comparisons to the famous failed us, and were soon abandoned by my companions in favor of fruits and vegetables. Like two melons, 
one of the twins observed, which led to speculation about other parts of the anatomy. At this mention of zucchini, however, Arnold called a halt to the discussion. <laughs> Guys, Jesus, give me a break, Arnold pleaded. I'm understanding, but I'm still straight. I have my limits. <laughs> Don't look at me, I retorted, for I had strenuously attempted to ignore this vulgar chatter. My thoughts were on a higher plane altogether. My heart was, as they say, full. Very full. <laughs> the young man who had arrived with Winnie stepped forward at the older man's command and extended his hand to each of us. An ocean roar filled my ears and drowned out all sound, but later I would learn his name. Did you? Hey? Our eyes met only briefly, yet any longer, and I might have been lost forever in the passionate depths of those luminous dark brown orbs, adorably shaded by an unruly lock of glossy black hair that kept falling perfectly across his forehead. His smile, however, sufficed to hint at everything our eyes could only attempt to express. The wordless exchange of kindred souls meeting at last, recognition, joy, pain, understanding, exquisite tenderness, shared dreams, smoldering passion. You understand, of course, that everything in that moment, for it was but a moment, and yet an eternity as well, transpired in a sweet, giddy, mystical blur, as if underwater at the bottom of a pool, looking up at the figures, waving and wobbling with the lapping of the water. I had looked into the boy's eyes, but at the same time I felt as though I had looked into his heart, perhaps even into his soul. Far away, the mundane world continued. There was a distant sound of laughter and small talk. <laughs> <laughs> what a small world, Winnie Tanninger observed to Arnold. He nodded to me, winked at our cohorts in their hooded sweatshirts, and swept onward, his young god in tow. As you can imagine, it's downhill from there with Sam and Didier. <laughs>